All right. Brandy, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you. Absolutely. So let's kind of just start with your story. I want to know more about why you got into fitness, why you got into nutrition, how you ended up working with Jason and becoming one of his coaches. I don't know. Were you one of the first coaches to work with him? Okay, that's what I thought. You were the very first one. So like, kind of give us a story of where you came from, how you got started, and then how that happened. Yeah, so originally, like way back, I had this aha moment or come to Jesus moment when I was 25, and I looked in the mirror and was just like, this cannot be as good as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> so... My husband's like a skinny guy, but I like, I'm short. I weighed as much as him. I wasn't like obese by any means, but definitely not, not in a healthy weight. Um, so kind of through that, I found CrossFit. My husband's a firefighter paramedic and uh, surprisingly a bunch of his people that he works with don't do it like you would think, but that's kind of how he found out about it. We started doing CrossFit. Uh, I started losing weight slowly. Then, like, nine months later, I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to have to change my diet. <laughs> so I was very hesitant. Um, and then that's when really everything really started changing, like, body comp and the weight. Um, we ended up opening our own CrossFit gym because back in 2007, there were not a lot of gyms around. So the only options for us were, like, over an hour away. And we uh, owned and ran that with a couple business partners for a little over seven years and it was like my full-time job for the majority of that time and then we sold uh, almost four years ago and I took a little break from working for a while started working with Jason as a client and uh, then after working with him for a while one day he just kind of asked me would you ever want to learn how to do this because I kind of like you know your personality and I can teach you the other stuff. And it really surprised me at how quickly I was like, yes. Like just totally like came right out of me. Right. Uh, and then even I was like, whoa, did I, do I really want to do this? Um, yeah, and I did. So he started mentoring me for a few months. I started taking clients in January two years ago. And he still like uh, monitored my stuff for like a, an initial like period. And then, yeah, and then from there, holy cow, it's like, so he's grown so much. Our company has grown so much, you know, since kind of that all started. Was there a certain point or did you have to personally go through the reverse diet stage? I'm just curious of what kind of got you because I knew of you because you are like the reverse diet person. After I watched that interview with him and, and him bringing you into the inner circle to do that interview kind of made it seem as if you were that person. You're coming out with an ebook on reverse dieting. So how did that all happen? How did you get down that rabbit hole? Yeah, so I mean, I started out uh, with a goal of wanting to lean out when I started working with him. And I come from a paleo background, so I was definitely not eating enough carbs for how much CrossFit I was doing. And I really wish I would have kind of known about that when I was more competitive in CrossFit because I kind of found out about it when I was like on the way out of being competitive. But um, yeah, so I started out with. Uh, kind of a little bit of a reverse and then a cut and then like a reverse, like a full reverse diet. And uh, it was so many things. Like it's so awesome. It's so hard. Like when you're going through it, uh, at first I was a hyper responder initially and I started losing even more weight while increasing, like especially my carbohydrates after being like in a deficit for so long with him. But that's also the thing is when you do it with a nutrition coach, you know, he knew how long to keep me in that deficit and then to bring me out. And right. that's unfortunately the problem a lot of people have is they don't even realize that they're doing something dangerous and they just think, well, I have to eat this small amount or I can't have any carbs or whatever. I have to fear eating fat or whatever it may be. At the end of the day, they're like in a really low amount of calories for way too long and it just messes up their metabolism. So initially for me, I was a hyper responder, kind of went through all the phases, then hit a like a leveling out phase um, and then kind of hit that surplus, real, real uncomfortable surplus phase where you start putting on a little bit of weight, a little bit of body fat and uh, your coach is just telling you it's OK, like this is what you need to do and you don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that's why it's good to have a coach. So. And then kind of full circle, then, you know, I think a lot of us go through that, then kind of then from there kind of finding like a good middle livable ground, you know, to kind of settle in at depend then when when different things come up with goals, then you can tweak things, 
you know, to get a little leaner again or work to get a little stronger, or hit some performance. So, so yeah. let's get into like time frame wise, because I think a lot of people like, I like what you said about the deficit thing. I think that, I mean, there's so many people out there that know technically by the science calories in versus calories out, right? You have to create a calorie deficit in order to lose body fat. But the issue with that is, is once you start going weeks and weeks and weeks in this deficit, obviously you have some hormonal issues. So why don't you kind of, do you have a specific range where you like to stop clients from being in a deficit, bring them back up to maintenance? What are some of the detriments? Yeah. So, I mean, I know it, we, I hear you say this too. It depends, right? Yeah. Everybody's, <laughs> so it depends on their personal history. Like have they yo-yo dieted their whole life? It's going to look a little different than someone who's never dieted before. Um, you know, then they're set up a lot better because their hormones and their metabolism are not like all messed up. Um, but yeah, so like for, uh, me with my clients, I will start them, you know, let's say they're starting out from being an under eater. So we have to first, even if their goal is to lose weight, I can't, I always tell them, I can't pull anything away from what you're already eating. Like if that's the scenario, right? If that's the case, you're eating such a small amount right now, I can't pull anything from you. So we start with the reverse and just slowly, you know, that's really the key is doing it slow and being patient. Uh, the slower you go, you know, the, the less likely you are to add body fat because it allows your metabolism to kind of like adjust and get used to more food coming in. Whereas if, you know, you have someone and they're eating 1200 calories and you're like, okay, I need you to be eating like 2100 or 2500, you know, you don't just jump all the way to that point because the body doesn't know what to do. The metabolism is not ready for that amount of food and you will just put on body fat like crazy. Um, so, you know, the slow approach is better in terms of how long. So what if, is slow real quick? What is slow yeah. to you? I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there that will like five gram carb people to death. And I think sometimes you can be obviously again, like you said, it depends, but I think there's time and places to be a little more aggressive and a little less aggressive, right? And how much you're adding in each week. I know I had a client who, and I, you might relate to this or have seen this too, who uh, thought she was doing keto. Um, and when I looked at her macros, I was like, no, you're just extremely low calorie. You're nowhere near keto. Um, and someone like that, I had to be like, you know what? We have to, because when you're eating 800 to 1,000 calories a day, I'm just like, we're taking an aggressive approach because you can't, I'm, I'm not going to add 10 grams of carbs and hope for some results. We're adding... 600 calories like tomorrow. Um, she yeah. was a hyper responder and then we slowed things way down. But what is a typical slow approach for you? Yeah. So like in terms of like a percentage of calories, I mean, sometimes you might go off of a percentage. Sometimes you might just see, right. Okay. This person's only eating less than a thousand calories. And as a bare minimum, I want them to start at, you know, 1400 or whatever you might choose. And a lot of that's going to be based off of the intake. They give you the history, right. About them and their training and, and how they've been feeling kind of why they're coming to you in the first place besides just weight loss or that type of a goal. So, um, I, I like to start people, especially the girls slow to earn their trust unless if it's like a really bad case where I'm like, Hey, look, we got to start high you know, aggressive at first and then we'll slow it down. So if you want like a percentage, like in terms of calories, like 20% increase is like on the higher end and something, you know, anywhere kind of below that 10 to 20. But then after the initial, based on their feedback, you know, I'm usually going 10 grams of carbs or two to five grams of fat, sometimes splitting a little bit of both. It kind of depends on where they kind of need to be headed and the time of year if they're a CrossFitter and they're getting towards the open right now, like carbs is like, as long yeah. as they're protein where it needs to be, they need carbs, you know? So, um, and if they are, you know, some other type of athlete in their season, that depends too. Um, but yeah, really it's like, if you can take it slow and steady for as long as possible, you know, usually kind of the better it ends up. Unless if the person is like, Hey, I know I'm pretty messed up. I want to be more aggressive. I'm okay if I put on more body fat, but basically the sooner I can get to this like maintenance or surplus, then the sooner I can look to diet again. And I want that, you know, so you got to keep that in mind too. I think one thing I really love about IN3 is the whole, like nobody ever talks about this, but like longevity, performance and aesthetics are kind of three different goals and people want to chase all these different things. So I think with yeah. the reverse dieting scenario, I tend to go a little bit slower when aesthetics is the goal. 
right? Whereas like I had somebody who was probably adrenal fatigue and a CrossFit competitor and I was like, you know what? You just need way more carbs, like period. So we did take an aggressive approach and she didn't gain a bunch of weight. But again, she's doing way more intense training than somebody looking for aesthetics is doing. So I think that plays a big role too, right? Yeah, well, and then that person is like, oh my gosh, my workouts feel so good. Right, right, yeah. Um, And that's actually a really cool thing too because I think when people start seeing PRs in the gym and they start seeing all these different things, that's a big motive. How big is um, stress-related, like environmental stuff, play a factor in how you go about reverse dieting? Oh, yeah, for sure. Reverse dieting or dieting, and like it's kind of the same answer, you know, like uh, people's – your diet is a really important, but it's one factor out of so many, you know, that are so important and stress and sleep, their schedule, how much they work out, whether it be too much, too little. Most people, uh, more of people that I work with are working out too much and having a hard time recognizing it. Um, you know, so that plays a part as most definitely. And sometimes you even just telling the client, that, you know, helping them to see like, hey, you had a really stressful week. I'm not too surprised that the scale did some funky things or we didn't really see any progress, you know, because look at what all happened throughout the week. And it kind of helps them to see because we're objective, right? If we're the coach, we're looking from the outside. And we still, I still want my clients to have the best success. However, I can look at what they're doing just a little bit differently than what they look at themselves. Right. Okay. So, Let's say somebody's listening to this and they are looking at their calories and they're eating eight times their body weight. They know they're not eating enough. They've been in this deficit for a while and they have to reverse diet. How high do you like to see a client get calories wise before you decide like, okay, we're at a good place. We can kind of like stop trying to bring calories up and we can focus on fat loss again. Because I have a lot of clients who, and you probably get this where you're going through that process and, and they hate the words, trust the process, but like you're going through that with them. And at a certain point they start like, asking you every week can we start cutting now can we start cutting now or can we go at it again if they're not a hyper responder to it right at what point are you like okay like we're good to go yeah so i try to stay away from formulas as much as possible because they're just a guideline right and each person is so different but i totally know what you mean and some people do need that and um so in terms of if they don't do crossfit I like to look at, you know, somewhere around body weight times 13, maybe 14. And a guy is going to probably get away with getting higher than a girl. And if they do CrossFit, I really try to push for that body weight times 14 at a minimum. Um, You know, but it doesn't always happen. Like you have to keep their their check-ins that they send in are, are so important because if maybe they just start putting on body weight like crazy, right? The scale is just like just going up and it's not showing any signs of stopping or maybe mentally like it's been, you know, a few months or six months or eight months or whatever. And they're just at their breaking point. You have to keep all of that into consideration because I tell my clients too, I said, Hey, I just want you to know, I know this is hard and we don't know each other very well yet, but I'm not going to let you gain like 40 pounds just for the sake of pushing you to this magical calorie amount, you know, that I'd like, I'd like to see that, but if we don't get there, that's okay. You know, the goal is, is just to restore some metabolic function, get as much out of it as we can with putting on minimal weight gain. And I try to, you know, get them, try to get yourself comfortable with gaining five to 10 pounds if need be, you know? Um, and then, but I try not to freak them out too much from the the beginning, right? You got, it's like, you want to be honest and let them know like where they are at and what they need, but not overwhelm them so much that they like, Oh, I changed my mind. I don't want to do this. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of people are hiring you to lose fat, right? Like you can't yeah. completely say, well, and, and sometimes you have to obviously, but, but I agree with you. Is there ever a point where you almost like take a pause just to make them feel better. Like you might in your head know, like there's no, like we're not where we need to be, but I can tell this person's getting antsy and I don't want them to quit and do something destructive. So I'm going to like take a two to three week hiatus just to let them feel like we're getting back into the kind of thing and then go back to the reverse diet or anything along those lines. Yeah, most definitely. So I'll do a couple of things. I will do like a diet break where I don't, I tell them like, just just not track anything really I want you just kind of like eat normally like intuitively and give them like anywhere from two days because for some people like 
they get really into the tracking and if you tell them they don't have to they kind of freak out so yeah. i'll like hey just two days like just give me two days or up to like a week especially like if they have a trip that they're going on and they've been you know they're kind of like at the end of their rope i'll say hey you know what just don't worry about it on your trip um sometimes i will say yeah you know what let's let's take a little break from this reverse diet and let's do let's bring things down a little bit for the next four to six weeks and test the waters and see how your body does and that shows both of us you know a lot of good feedback because if their body doesn't respond favorably then it shows them or if you're doing it kind of trying to do it on your own it shows you that your body's not ready right no matter your mind yes your mind's like um hello i need to lose body fat you know but your your body is not ready and it, so it kind of helps the coach solidify that what they're doing is the right thing. And it helps the client see that, shoot, even though we're cutting calories, you know, for like the last month to six weeks or whatever, like I'm still not losing weight. And so then I can try to, you know, explain to my clients, like in that scenario, I would rather have you eating more and feeling better than like eating less and not getting the results that you want. Exactly. You know, so that's Let's just spend a little more time here. And sometimes we will like go two steps forward, one step back, right? So I have some clients who their bodies are so stubborn for whatever reason, just a, a whole lifetime of like under eating and then binging or whatever it may be. So we'll reverse diet for a few months. Oh, and then we will. Sorry, I had a call coming in. <laughs> Am I still here? <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can come back. Can you still see me? Nope. Oh boy. Sorry. Trying to come back to you. All good. Come back. I wish there was a way you could like turn your phone to not receive calls, but still be able to do <laughs> this. I know. So, well, you might be able to go airplane mode. You might. But you might. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I do have a few clients that we have to like baby step it. So we're like reverse dieting for a chunk and then we're like cutting down for a little bit and like just getting like the tiniest bit of, you know, weight loss and just going back and forth and back and forth. But it's just, everyone is so different. But I will say like, if you're coming to a reverse diet after an active smart diet phase, like you've been on a lean out for 12 weeks or 16 weeks or whatever, like get in your mind that you're going to reverse diet for at least as long as you dieted for and potentially up to twice as long. Okay. So, you know, that's kind of the hard thing is, we're so impatient and we're, I mean, we can get anything so fast anytime. Right. So, but there's no quick fixes that last long term when it comes to the body and diet and exercise. Well, and that's what I was going to say too, is like, I always try to preach longevity and I always ask clients like, Hey, would you rather do a rapid weight loss and get there so quick that you can't even sustain it? Or would you rather take some more time and then actually next year still look as good as you did when we're at the end of the diet? Like, that's the whole purpose behind this, right? And I think, like, I know for me, once I really started implementing just different ways of essentially recording biofeedback with clients, they kind of comprehended better, like, oh, when I do this, I feel better, I sleep better. But if we're not tracking sleep or mood or cravings, then we never know if it's improving. Exactly. Like, in the, I mean, the weight scale weight is just one factor out of so many and of course to most of the time to the client it's the most important and the only one they really care about but yeah helping them see like all the good things like I do have one client who's been reverse dieting for quite a while and she was noticing that her immune system is so much better this year her kids got sick her husband got sick she's not gotten sick you know and she's hit PRs in the gym and so she's like yeah I don't have I don't have a six pack but <laughs> you know I am a lot healthier this year in terms of not catching all the bugs that are going around everywhere and her, she's doing better in the gym and, and helping people see that is really big. Yeah. And I think it's just tracking in general. I love it so much because I know from, I mean, shit, like I hired you for this exact reason because I wasn't tracking anything because I was worried about my clients. I was worried about the house we're getting my fiance. I was like, I don't got time to worry about my stuff. But I knew if I was going to hire you, like I would have to record to give you some data. And then I'm like, oh my God, I'm under eating. Like, and I wasn't severe, <laughs> but I probably wasn't eating enough calories or especially fat, obviously. And I, and it's one of those awareness tools, right? Like I didn't really even notice that I didn't feel that great until like we bumped up my fat by 10 grams. And now I'm like, man, I actually feel a lot better. Like in many ways, yeah. you know what I mean? And I haven't gained any weight. So yeah, 
how often do you like see more people under eating compared to overeating? I think that it, people are shocked when I tell them how like how big of a percentage of clients that come to me that are actually under eating and not just overeating. Oh yeah, it's the majority. I mean, I would say nine out of ten, or even like nine point something out of ten, are not eating enough, and that's prohibiting them from reaching their goals. Even if even if the goal is better body composition and fat loss. Yeah. Do you find that like I know for me at least when when clients come to me, if they're in a like if it's really really bad, obviously I'm like, hey, it's gonna take a while. But I find that a lot of the hype like there's a lot of people I have that actually are hyper responders because they're only under eating by 500 calories or less, so it's not so severe that it's like detrimental. But we just make a yeah. little bump up with protein and carbs, and then all of a sudden they start seeing crazy results. Yeah, yeah, and those people that are kind of like in the middle, right, where they're like, well, they yeah, they're under eating a little bit, but it's not like super dangerous severe i'm still going to start them with a reverse diet because i want them to get as high as possible before we start like really going into a deficit because that's going to set you up for better and sustainable you know diet phase throughout the whole thing yeah and and i I would add to that too that a lot of those people that are in the middle usually they're like i see this all the time like monday through friday it's like okay you're kind of under eating hey you didn't track saturday sunday what's going on and like yeah. you come to find those are like cheat days. Yeah. What happened on Saturday? I have one. <laughs> I have one client who I had to add to her tracker, a little column for snacky bits where she puts like a <laughs> number. Of, Cause she's like, well, I have a little taste of this or that, that I don't track. Cause you know, I kind of think maybe it doesn't count or I just don't know what, what it is. So I said, okay, well we just need, the, we need some data, you know? So let's see how often is it happening? So the, and it has, it has helped her cut back on it at least, you know, just anywhere you can create awareness, right? It helps. 100%. And I, I think that most of the people who are slightly overeating and not seeing results because of that versus under eating usually are overeating because of things like that, like snacks here and there, or their kids are eating some, so they have a bite or like condiments. Oh, I didn't track that because it's just dressing. And it's like, okay, well, when you put four tablespoons of dressing on your salad, shit adds right. up. So yeah. Cool. So what about, um, I'm curious about body recomposition. This is something I want to talk to you about since you do so much, re, uh, reverse dieting. I have found that most people know body recomp is kind of impossible unless you're a newbie, right? Like if you, if this is day one in the gym, you can probably burn a lot of fat and build a lot of muscle, but for everybody else, it's almost impossible. But I have found that the only people that seem to be able to do some of this are people who end up reverse dieting. Like, have you found any body recomp people with that aren't newbies? I mean, I have some girls who do CrossFit who have gained 10 pounds on the scale, and you can't even tell. They wear the same out clothes. Their body looks essentially the same. They're hitting PRs. Like, they don't have, like, a ton more muscle showing, but, like, they've gained 10 pounds. And, you know, most girls would freak out about gaining 10 pounds, but, um, you know, for the couple in this situation, like, once they kind of got over the initial shock of seeing the scale go up, once they realized that their body actually wasn't necessarily growing in a way that wouldn't allow them to wear their clothes, <laughs> then they were like, well, I guess it doesn't matter because my performance is good, you know, and all these things. So that's one instance where I see it happen. And then, yeah, I mean, just a lot of these people who have been under, it's like if you're brand new to any sort of like exercise, then you go only go up, right, for yeah. quite a while. And if you've been under eating for a long time and have been doing some sort of exercise activity sport, it's kind of the same thing. I think that's what you're saying is like for a a period of time at the beginning, it's like your body finally can be like, oh my gosh, here we can finally like do something with all of this that's been, you know, all of this um, movement we've been getting used to, but we haven't had what we need to like build the muscle behind it. Right. And I mean, half the time, it's like, I I see a ton of people, I always tell them like, you can do damn near anything in the gym when you first start. And if you're lifting, Mm -hmm. you're going to build some muscle. But like for somebody like me, who's been lifting for seven, eight years, I have to be pretty damn specific about what I'm doing and trying to build muscle. Um, So I know for me personally, lately, since actually, since I started working with you, because I've been so diligent about tracking, I've noticed a little bit of that. I haven't dropped any weight. I've, I've been up and down a pound. Um, but it's been so like diligent about like actually getting refeed days in, actually hitting my carbs every day. And I feel, I don't think it's a body recomp, but I feel way fuller because it's just awareness to actually be hitting my numbers. 
Yeah. And then I think too, someone like you probably doesn't have this problem, but you know, a lot of people struggle to get enough protein. And so in terms of body recomp, like that goes a long way. If you haven't been eating enough, pro like maybe you're getting enough calories, let's say, but you're really low on protein. Like that's going to prevent you from seeing like that lean look you want or getting more muscle. So even just like kind of like re configuring where their macro and where the calories, you know, that their macros make up are coming from, even that can uh, help a lot. Yeah, big time. And that's actually one of the first macros that I will bump up in a reverse diet for a lot of people. And I don't know if you do the same, but if, if I know your calories are under, but your protein is way under, I'll make an aggressive jump because I know it's not going to store as fat. Like if we bump you up to a, a normal protein level, which is high for most people, but you're training a lot, we can give you a lot more calories via protein without worrying about added fat. Yeah, it's so true. I have a lot of people who I kind of have to baby step their protein because they need to be at like 150 and they've been eating like 75. And if I like jump them too much, one, they'll be not hungry to eat their other food. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I like them to be able to learn how to get their protein and slowly do it. But yeah, I mean, I will most definitely like in that scenario too, like I'll bump protein and something else right so i'll be like let's get a little bit more protein oh and here's some more carbs for you too yeah um <laughs> yeah do you have anybody that you've had to actually bring down because what's funny is when i was intuitively eating i i'm a meat eater and I, I when i started tracking i was like i am eating way too much protein and i actually noticed way better digestion bloat. i just looked leaner because i wasn't bloated all the time and i was like fuck i was just eating too much protein and i've ran into some like bodybuilder classic old school bodybuilder diets that they're eating way too much. Do you ever have that where you have to almost just not even adjust their total calories, but just completely flip their mm -hmm. macros? Only with a couple of people. And um, I had, yeah, I have a couple of girls who are pretty small and they just love to eat protein. And I'm like, okay, well, let's just experiment with bringing it down just a little closer to your body weight. You know, they're pretty tiny. So I'm like, we can keep you like above above body weight is like 115 or less you know i'm like but you don't need to be eating like 175 grams of protein a day like let's give you some carbs instead um and then i had a guy who accidentally you know how in my fitness pal if you like log something wrong one time and forget like you don't ever go back and like double check it and so he had been logging he picked some like chicken entry that was like so not even close like way too low so with what his check-ins were saying, I'm like, you know what? You better send me your food logs. Let me take a look. And then I saw that. I'm like, that's not right. So he was actually way overeating on his protein um, unintentionally. And I'm like, didn't you feel like you were eating like, protein all, all the time? And he was like, yes, it was getting so hard. <laughs> but he was eating like 50 extra grams of protein a day. And uh, anyway, so yeah, he, and even with him, like once we pulled that back to where it should be, like, this the scale started going the right direction again and uh yeah and i see that with bloating too i think people some people are really scared of protein like oh you know um i can't have too much or whatever but for the most part it's like carbs and fats that people get really scared about right protein can be hard hard for people to get enough in but they usually aren't like afraid when you tell them they need to eat it like right. they can sometimes with carbs and fats so and i think the media and everything is kind of glorified protein right like there's even i mean i don't know if you've seen this but there's snickers protein bars now there's uh yeah it's crazy yeah. there's so many and then there's like cereal special k with fortified with extra protein and like all these yeah. different things so it's so glorified that people think they need it like it's the mac uh, magic macronutrient and i even did that way back too when i was like because i got on stage i did the old school bodybuilding thing with a coach I was eating like 265 grams of protein. I, I followed a meal plan, so I didn't even know. And then once I started learning about all this stuff, I calculated it and I was like, that's literally, I got on stage at 155 pounds. I was like, this is nuts. Like, so when oh I, yeah. And so it, you get in this mode where like, I need protein to maintain this muscle. Once I like lowered my protein to around my body weight and sometimes even like less. And I was like, oh wait. I didn't add fat or lose muscle when I added carbs instead of protein. It was kind of like this aha moment. And I think a lot of people need to experience that so they don't glorify one macronutrient. Yeah, I mean, too much of anything is not good for you, right? Like, yeah. No matter how something is, like too much water will kill you, you know? So you gotta, yeah, it's got to take everything all in, all uh, 
all in and, and it's just like exercise, right? Some is good. More is not always better. Right. So how do you, so, let's get into like macros versus micros. How do you prioritize people to actually hit enough micros? Cause I feel like with the IIFYM movement, it's pretty mm-hmm. big on the macro side. And I think that macros are extremely important yep. because that's, what's going to determine a lot of hormonal health, a lot of performance and a lot of body composition. But mm-hmm. I don't think we can neglect micros. So how do you go about teaching clients the importance of both? Right. Basically, I just try to – I get them to understand from the beginning that they have full control over what foods they use to meet their macros. However, food quality is so important for their long-term health. It's going to help them with their goals. It's going to allow them – So if their macros are on the lower end, obviously it's going to get them more actual food they can eat You know, versus like filling it with like bagels and Pop-Tarts and all that stuff. Um so I just talked to them about that. Some clients I'll set like a fiber number for if I if they're really struggling food quality. But I basically that's one of the things that actually first drew me to Jason from the get go was uh, he had an emphasis on food quality, but not like that was the only option, right? It was like having a little balance. And for me coming from a paleo background, I wasn't ready to I I uh, drug my feet to even try macros because of all of the junk food involved and how it's advertised or whatever, how it's usually promoted, right? right? That really turned me me off to trying macros at all. So uh, seeing, you know, he, Jason was the first person that I became aware of that was doing uh, macros, macro coaching that I thought, I think I could actually, you know, this could work, this relationship and, and uh, this mix could work. And so I really liked that. So it also depends on the person for some people, it's like maybe at first I the if it fits your macros gets them in the door right and then we start slowly turning that food quality and prioritizing you know a little more vegetables a little less bread and things like a little less sugar um, and so yeah it's again it depends on the client but it really just talking to them about the importance of nutrient dense and high quality foods yeah and I I love the way you put that and one thing that. I get on my consultation calls, like I have a consultation call before I onboard any client and they'll always ask me like, so how, what is it going to look like at first? Like, what are you going to send me first for my diet? And I'm like, well, it really depends on where you're at, right? Because if you are super paleo, then we want to slowly wean into that. But if you're eating a ton of junk food, then I might prioritize just adding in some healthy food first. We might not jump right to macros, right? So there's so many different ways that you can approach it. Um, yeah. and something Ivan, I'd actually like to get your experience or an opinion on this since you did the paleo thing. Um, I've had a lot of people come to me who have, uh, I call them like chronic whole 30 dieters, right? And they just, they always do whole 30. And then after a while they come back to it and they do it again. And, and I'm helping somebody out right now that has always done that. And I had to explain to her macros and everything. And I was like, so let's just get you tracking. You can keep doing whole 30, but I just want to see where your numbers are at. And I had a feeling she was under eating because she was doing whole 30. And sure enough, she was under eating by a lot and we had to reverse diet her. And now she's finally losing weight. But I always get scared of paleo and Whole30 for that exact reason. So, I mean, what's your opinion on that? Do you like, like, what are the pros and what are the cons of a paleo diet? Yeah. So, I mean, the great thing about, you know, using, no matter what you want to call it, nutrient dense foods, right? High quality nutrient dense foods. Everyone can benefit from more of those. So the great thing about macros is if those are the foods that you're most comfortable with, you can still hit your macros with those types of foods, you know, unless if you're like some really big time um, guy or even some like big time girls who have like massive amounts of carbs, right? Most people can make it work. Or maybe you can get them to understand like maybe they'll be comfortable with rice or oats, like adding in some of those other things to help them get their carbs. But, um... I didn't veer off from any paleo foods for the first three months that I did macros because I wasn't ready, you know? And, um, and again, because Jason never told me any food I had to eat. He just told me the protein, carbs, and fats and make it happen. Right. So, and then slowly as my carbs got higher and I kind of had more trust. Right. And, and, um, I didn't do multiple, multiple whole thirties cause I learned a long time ago that like, that's not really a cycle I want to continue, but I did fall into the trap of eating clean all week long. And then cheat day was like, how much junk can I cram in my face <laughs> from the time we get done at CrossFit till I go to bed? 
Um, and then I realized that like, I felt terrible. That'd be like Saturday. I felt terrible until Wednesday. Yeah. And I did that so long. And then finally I was like, what am I doing to myself? First of all, I'm working way too hard in the gym to be doing this, you know, to be doing that. And I, what I'm putting in my body and what I'm training for in the gym, like they need to match up. So, you know, one, I need to like, for me, it was like, I got to stop doing that. So how do I stop doing that? I need to start eating a little bit more like during the week. Right. Um, that helped a lot. And then obviously getting macros and getting like the proper getting adequate, like actually knowing what adequate is with working with a coach helped a ton. So yeah, for my clients, especially when they start, it's like, if they're from the paleo background, I just talk to them about like, okay, so what carb sources are you comfortable with? Sweet potatoes. Yes. Okay. How about white potatoes? Some are and some aren't right. And so then I kind of educate them on that. What about rice? What about oats? And then we, I try to help them find, you know, some things that they're comfortable with. And then again, just slowly trusting the process of it's up to them, but I'm going to help give them some ideas, you know, of how they could do it. And then a lot of them will find, you know, oh my gosh, I used to only eat this, you know, on my cheat day, or used to be afraid to eat this because I would get fat. And then they, they have an appropriate serving, which was also my problem is because I wouldn't allow myself to have something for so long. What I would have ice cream, I would have like a bowl of yeah. ice cream, right? Like a small serving. <laughs> um, I would eat a whole pizza by myself. So <laughs> it's helping. That's one of the best things I think about macros is it really helps teach people good portion control. Even if you are going to fill the majority of your food with junk, you can't hit your protein, carbs, and fats with all junk food like yeah. it doesn't happen so yeah. you have to have things in there um and so like even on a worst case scenario if you're totally just doing that way of doing it um which isn't good by any means but hopefully with the way that you know we coach our clients and like you coach your clients we're teaching them that this is helping them to see what good portions look like you know and depending on what phase they are in if they're eating for performance or if they're in a diet how those portions and ratios kind of change Right. I, it's funny that you said that because I remember doing the same thing on the weekends. We had a, uh, I worked at this like garage style gym and we had this place called, so like in Seattle, Pike Place is like this big farmer's market like thing. There was Pike Place Bakery like two doors down. And every Saturday we would do like a strongman workout and we would go to this bakery and just get so much bad shit. And then I would go home and I would eat whatever and it just turned in the whole day. And the same thing, I would feel like shit for days. Yeah. And it's funny because you do that to yourself like weekend after weekend after weekend and I kept doing it. Um, but one thing I do like about paleo-ish foods is that like if you are on a cut or if you're on a diet, it's almost, it's extremely filling. So like knowing that those foods, you're going to get more bang for your buck for the yeah. amount of calories you have is a smart tool to use when you're dieting or when you have to – like let's say you are going to be flexible and you're going to have some beer at night. Well, maybe you should eat paleo for the day because you're going to be more filled with fibrous and high-protein foods. Um, so I think that it really is important but it does kind of come down to this balance. Um, I, I wrote a blog and this just came up in my head and I want to get your opinion on it too. I wrote a blog recently. It was like diet hacks to help like break plateaus. And I talked about quality without – like changing the quality of your food without changing your macros, right? So I had a client who was tracking and he wasn't under eating by any means. He was overeating at the point. He had really good metabolic flexibility because he was working on building that capacity up before he worked with me. I think he was with uh, Eat to Perform. And he came to me and we actually did cut calories a little bit because I was like, you have room to play. And he, he wasn't dropping. He was being stubborn. His biofeedback wasn't good even though he was sleeping. He wasn't overtraining. He was eating enough. Finally, I dug into his my fitness pal and I was like, dude, you're just not getting any greens. Like your only green is romaine lettuce and that does not count in my book. There's no fruit. There's no colors and they're veggies. So we actually – I was like, hey, we're not going to cut any macros but I want to – like I gave him a checklist, right? And it's like I want to see like omega-3s. I want to see some like healthier saturated fats. I want to see more colors, dark greens in your diet and the scale started budging and he's been dropping weight for the last three weeks ever since we did that and we didn't make any macro changes. Do you ever right. come to that same thing? Yeah, I mean, in yeah, I have a, a few clients where I'll talk to them about, I'll look at their food logs, and I, I have a vegetarian client. Well, she does eat, she mostly does dairy and like some eggs, but she hardly eats any vegetables, which I know is not too uncommon for, you know, some vegetarians, but... I'm like, okay, we need, you know, we need to get some green stuff in here and not a, not a Morningstar sausage patty counts as vegetables. Like I want like actual vegetables, you know, right. 
And I will talk to people too about, you know, um, pulling out gluten for a month and pulling out dairy for a month because a lot of people don't realize that it's causing them to be kind of puffy and bloated because maybe they don't feel like some people, you know, have gluten or dairy and like their stomach is a mess. Like they know it's not good for them, but other people it's maybe more mild and they don't realize that it's kind of causing inflammation in their body. So I'm not a stickler with it for everybody, you know, and, and still it's their choice, but I will at least pose it as, Hey, this might be something to try. Here's why I think we should try it. And if it doesn't work, you can always add it back in, you know? So I think stuff like that is good and food quality. Yeah. It's always good to uh, take a fresh look and, and emphasize food quality and, and changing things up too, right? Like if they're the kind of person that eats the same thing every day, maybe even just, changing up something that they're eating might help kind of kick things, change things up a little bit inside the body too. Yeah. It was funny. Cause I actually asked him too, like, Hey, now that we've been doing this for a couple weeks, are you enjoying greens now? And he was like, actually surprisingly, yes. Like I actually like trying to find ways to cook them or doing different things with them. And I was like, good. Like you want to feel good eating that food. Um, one thing I want to ask you, because I asked Jason this and I love his opinion and I asked Travis and it's a completely opposite opinion and that's why I asked them. But I'm curious for you because you're on the same team. Artificial sweeteners. How do you feel about them? Do you add them in? Do you limit them? I don't use them. I oh, no. Terrible. So <laughs> <laughs> I just tell people, you know, um, my advice I give to them really is limit it. And notice if it makes you tend to crave more sugary type foods, because let's say it's a Coke Zero or a stick or whatever, you know, it has calorie free, but is it giving you that sensation of craving of more sugar? And if it does, you need to be aware of that because over time, that's going to be harder and harder to have the willpower to say no. And you're going to end up, you know, having something that's maybe not calorie free, you know, or I have a. So I have a client who had a big soda problem, but it was like always like diet or zero. And uh, we got her like weaned off her soda. And she does notice now that if she has one occasionally, even though it's calorie free, makes her crave more sugary things. Um, so yeah, so I'm probably not the best person to ask about all that stuff. Cause like, I don't, I just have never liked it myself personally. And uh, I obviously don't see any reason why if you're not using it, why you should start. Right. What about things like Halo Top? That's a big thing. Halo Top, Arc Zero, all these ice creams. For sure. Yeah, I had a Halo Top phase where I had a half to a whole pint every day for several <laughs> months. Several months. Um, because I just loved it. And in terms of like diet-ish ice cream, it actually tastes decent. Yeah. You know, and it was just so weird. And then I got to a point one day where I was like, meh, it's just not tasting as good anymore. And I don't need, I haven't had it in like almost a year. So, but yeah, for people, if they want that and, um, for some people starting out, it can be like a carrot to dangle. Like, Hey, if you're having a hard time getting your protein and you like ice cream, right. check out this stuff. It can be a nice little, you know, treat, but still is somewhat decent. But also some people don't handle the, like erythritol in it very well. So you have to be careful of that. If your stomach doesn't really handle it, right. you've got to know. Did you notice any difference between your diet, your gut, your body composition, performance, anything when you added stuff like that in and took it out? Um, not necessarily. No, I didn't. That's probably music <laughs> to people's ears. And I'm, I'm going to like, I had a quick phase of it too. Um, and I still eat it every once in a while, but, uh, when Shannon had her like kind of craving phase through the pregnancy, she wanted ice cream and I was like, okay, well, I'll go get you some ice cream. And I, I was like, I'm not going to eat Ben and Jerry's because if I get a Ben and Jerry's, I'll eat the whole, the whole pint Yeah. and she'll have like, like an eighth of it. So like, she'll just nibble on it and then she's done. But I'm like, okay, I got to get Halo Top. But then she kept wanting to have like ice cream and movies. So it was like, okay, every day I was like, I'm going to have a Halo Top. It took me a while to be like, okay, I don't need this. This is not Yeah. probably the so best I, thing. I mean, I think a lot of us, when we, at some point in our macroing, we might get a little caught up in that if it fits, right? Like I still had plenty of food quality, but like I started my day by putting that halo top in first and then yeah. I built around it. And that's totally <laughs> fine to do like occasionally, but again, it ran its course, right? So uh, yeah, but I think coming back full circle to, you know, emphasize this as much as possible on food quality and getting your clients to see the difference because I think maybe for me and maybe for you too is because there already is a good emphasis on food quality that having that little bit 
uh, maybe isn't so bad. Whereas somebody whose majority of their diet is garbage and then they start adding in some like veggies and some fruits, they might be like, holy moly, like yeah. I feel much better, you know, because they just have so much garbage in their body. So do you have a checklist that you could give the listeners? Because I know for me, it's like I believe in flexibility, but – before you can add those kind of things in your calories, you got to make sure you get this, 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 don't forget this, so on and so forth. Do you have a checklist that you kind of provide or that you would suggest people to go off of? I don't give them one. Like I try to just keep it as simplified as possible and get to stuff like that if I feel like there's a need. Um, so I have had some people when I look through their food logs, I'll say, I'm not really seeing any vegetables in here. You know, like, let's start with that. Like, Give me something, some broccoli, some cauliflower, some kale, spinach, you know, something along those lines and um, work towards that. But I I don't get too, like, strict uh, with people in that regard unless if it really is necessary. Okay. So let's talk before the call ends. Let's talk about your book. I want to know more about it. Like, what is it about? What is the, like, route, how it's going to start to finish? Give me the rundown. Yeah. So it's a ebook on reverse dieting and – um, Jason is kind of like going through it now what I wrote and so hopefully it's going to be out in like the next few weeks but I'll definitely keep you posted on that and so what it's designed for is it's designed for somebody who could do their own reverse diet like get started on it get implemented understand why they might need a reverse diet because maybe I mean most people they don't think that they need to eat more they're scared of the idea of eating more um so, yeah, it kind of goes into all that of what, you know, things that can happen as to why you're not losing weight and maybe even starting to gain weight with your current low calories and maybe high exercise output um, and talking about, you know, some small things. Travis is definitely the expert, but minor things of how it affects the downregulation of your metabolism and your thyroid and sex hormones. And how all of that plays together as to, you know, why you're not losing weight anymore and why you need to switch gears and let things recover before you can diet again. So, yeah. Nice. So it's pretty much like the go-to guide for anybody who isn't working with a coach or maybe isn't ready to invest enough money to really dive into that. It's probably a good gateway towards that. Yeah, it's a good, a really good starting place. And it's good, you know, I know a lot of people just like to kind of learn about different methods And so it can be good just as a tool to learn about and maybe try just like how if you learn about like the whole 30, you might think, oh, I might try that. Granted, it's set for a certain period of time and reverse dieting is not, it's not always set for a certain amount of time, but you could even experiment with it for like a couple of months and, you know, just to kind of see how your body does. But we also talk about like not really going into like those biofeedback markers, right? So the scale weight is not the only thing. And sometimes it's like the least important in my eyes as the coach when it comes to reverse dieting, right? I want to know everything else. How's their energy? How are they feeling in the gym? Are they sleeping better? Do they fall asleep faster? Get up less times? You know, are they uh, less sore from their workouts? Are they able to, let's assume they're not overtraining. Like, were they able to add in an extra day because they finally had the energy you know, to go a little bit more and, and, uh, things like that. And outside of the gym too, of course, you know, just having the energy to do things with their kids and go have, you know, fun times with friends and things like that. Yeah, no, I love it. I think for any of the coaches out there in general, maybe you're not a full blown nutrition coach. You're just a trainer right now. Highly recommend you check it out simply because I think we both know that under eating is probably the biggest cause of lack of results or why people aren't seeing results, whether it is performance or body composition. But there's a lot of trainers out there who get clients who are just stuck and not losing weight and they do not know why. They don't get it. We're training hard. They're doing cardio. They're eating really clean. Why aren't they losing weight? And this is nine times out of 10 the exact reason why. Um, And if it is a specific hormonal reason, again, this is probably why. Yeah, and then they get so frustrated because they're eating – so little so perfect right they're following everything perfect doing all their cardio or hitting their two a days at crossfit or whatever it may be and yet they're not losing weight and maybe even getting a little bit chubbier you know around the middle and if they just continue on that path they'll just get into a deeper darker hole and it's even harder to come out of you know right you finally hit that point so yeah so hoping that this book kind of helps also some people maybe see and realize like, oh, I think that might be me. You know, I think yeah. I 
I need to do this. So, and a lot of times too, like when you've hit the end of your rope and what you're doing is not working, it's like, okay, well, what, what other options do you have? Like you can't continue to, you know, eat so little and work out so much. So why not just try, you know, something that totally doesn't make any sense by eating more for your period of time and just see what happens. Yeah. And that's the, uh, that's honestly the question I was always asked, like, what's the worst that could happen? And they'll tell me, well, I mean, I could gain a couple pounds and I'm like, okay. And what you were doing before, was that losing you any weight? No. And I'm like, okay, so do you want to give it a try? <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. I'm really in that situation, they're not going to be able to continue and they're going to totally end up like binging or start having like the major yo-yo if they aren't already. Right. right. So that's the other thing too is the reverse diet can help get them out of that and find even just a more like maintainable way to eat. And then, you know, even going above and beyond that to really restore things to be able to diet again later. Yeah, I love it. And it's just, I love how much we reiterated like feeling of stuff because there's so many people out there who actually, they don't know they feel like shit because they've never felt great. Like they don't know what it feels like to be optimal. And I think it's really important to take in this message just so you eat enough to actually, because food can make you feel so good. And that's why I'm so passionate about nutrition. It's, it's so tied to so many things. Yeah. So, so one last question before we get off the call. I always ask a personality question and it's, it's a funny one. So you are flying, you're in Utah. So I don't know how long this flight would be for me. It's 13 hours, but you're on a long flight going to Japan. You're in the middle row seat and there's two empty seats right next to you. You can have anybody in those seats alive or dead, but it cannot be friends or family. Who is sitting next to you? Okay, so I cheated because I listened to Travis's interview. So I thought if I get asked this thing, <laughs> what is my answer going to be? It's a tough one. It is. He took like awesome. five minutes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I thought about this, and this is going to sound so silly. But okay, so there's this old gentleman that lives somewhere in my general neighborhood who I have seen for many years. He has one leg and he rides a motor scooter and it has like a sidecar. So I, for like balance, I assume. And I always think that he has like a, a leg, like a prosthetic leg in the sidecar, right? <laughs> I have, I'm like his stalker. I have followed him a little bit. To like, try to figure out where does he go? Um, and he's always like on side streets, like nothing real major. But then most recently I've seen him on like a, a bicycle, like a, like an old man tricycle bicycle, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. How does he pedal that? He only has one <laughs> leg. And so I just, I want to know his story. So I wouldn't have anybody in the other seat. It would just be me and him. And I just want to hear his story and learn all about him because that guy is tough. Like, I don't know much about him, but he's got to be tough if he's like uh, one legged commuting around from like a motor scooter to now on a bicycle. <laughs> and I just, I'm curious about him. You know what? He's got to have a crazy story. And right? otherwise, you're just going to go to sleep because that would suck yeah. if you, you sat down and he didn't have an awesome story. But a lot of random people like that actually – like I'm one of those guys who if somebody starts talking to me, I will sit down. I'll stop what I'm doing at a random place and talk to somebody because yeah. you have some of the coolest conversations with random people, but especially people like that because he's got to yeah. have some some background story that's epic. Yeah, and I really enjoy talking to like elderly people because they just have so much like – life experience and wisdom and um and sometimes they say things that are super inappropriate because they like have no filter anymore so they don't care anymore yeah they just don't care you can get a good crack out of it i you know what like i have to throw this in because gary v said this one time too and he was like the most powerful thing he ever did he went to a retirement center and he just started talking to people and he said that the number one thing he heard was regret and he was like and i learned that i can't ever regret anything but that encouraged me to go like visit and talk to my grandparents more or just talk to random it sounds weird, but random old people that I would see because yeah. they honestly have been through so much. And like in the last hundred years, you would be surprised at how much has changed. Like I was listening to Joe Rogan talk about it. He was like 10, 15 years ago, if you would have told me that I could record like this and then put it on YouTube and somebody in India could watch it, I would have just laughed at you like you're you're insane. But like so much has changed since those people were our age or even younger that it's just like it's unbelievable to hear their stories. Yeah. Completely off topic, but <laughs> yeah, but no, I agree. Totally <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And I will definitely keep everybody in tune with when your book launches. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it too.